Starting today, Ontario PC leader Tim Hudak is traveling the province delivering what he's calling straight talk about the state of Ontario's economy. And he's here with us tonight for more. Tim Hudak, welcome back to TVO. Thanks for being back on and all the best in the new year too. Thank you very much to you and yours as well. Uh, as we suggested earlier this evening was your first, I guess, road test of this new speech that you are giving across the province. It's called When the Money Runs Out. In a nutshell, what's the message? Uh, Ontario's in a mess. There have been deliberate decisions made by the current government that made the hole even deeper. But you know what? There's hope on the way. We can get ourselves out of this and we put a plan forward to help us get jobs back to our province and the books back in balance to protect the things we care about. What do you hope to accomplish with this new, is it a PowerPoint presentation? Well, I don't know if that's the exact program we're using, but more or less. So, okay. you and I have talked about this before. I did town halls across the province, 50 some, in where the big cities like Toronto, small towns, northern Ontario. Talked about my vision for a strong Ontario, where it's the best public services, a strong economy, best place to set up a business. How do we get there? Got feedback from people, so now I'm going back out with a bigger show. So it's a multimedia presentation that illustrates where we are today when it comes to our finances, the state of our economy, how we got here, because we can't, if we want to give a prescription for the, the ailment, we have to understand um, the diagnosis to begin with. And then how do you get out of the hole? How can Ontario bounce back? And I have a strong sense of optimism we can do that. I mean, that's been our history. We can dust ourselves off. We can climb out of the hole. We can move forward. Decisions are out there. They're tough decisions, but we can move forward. I have read the speech. I've not seen you present it yet. I will at some point. So I can't tell from the text necessarily, absent a performance, whether this is supposed to be a kind of a partisan rev up, go Tories, go let's rev up the base kind of a thing. No, it's, it's more um, straight talk. And, and your viewers who, I mean, it was live streamed earlier, and it's on our website, OntarioPC.com. And from Toronto, I'm taking it out on the road for the next number of, of months. They can see it live or uh, through the website. No, it's, it's more, it's, it's basically straight talk. I mean, it is sobering when you look at how deep the uh, debt crisis is. It is sobering when you look at the job losses in our economy where Ontario stands with you know, the rest of the provinces compared to where we should be. But as I said, there's also a, you know, a sense of, uh, of hope, of faith that we can, we can turn things around if we make some pretty tough decisions about reducing spending, getting government focused on core services, kickstarting economic growth. But I, I wouldn't describe it as partisan in the least. I'm sure I'm going to talk about our ideas, but it's a, a, a real um, direct message to taxpayers in this province where we stand today and how we climb out of it. If the Liberals adopt some of the ideas that you're talking about, those tougher decisions, should we leave them in and let them do it? Well, let, let's see exactly what they bring forward. And I, I guess in a couple of areas there's been some small responses. I mean, I, I feel proud that, you know, members of my team with our white papers, Passive Prosperity, are driving an agenda of change in the province. But when I, when I listen to what the Liberal leadership candidates are talking about, I'm not seeing much change at all. They talk about communicating better or listening. They don't seem to understand uh, the challenges that we face and, and how serious a problem is, nor does there seem to be a recognition that it was decisions to increase taxes, drive up hydro rates, to try to appease public sector unions by giving them pretty well what they ask for that got us into the hole. Not this last time. But, <laughs> Not Bill 115. Well, it was a, a habit pretty tough to, to break. I mean, you look at the... Here's a case in point. I'll, I'll hit that and I'll get back to the other point I was going to make. Um, you raised Bill 115. Well, I mean, it's a creature of necessity. As you know, we called for an across-the-board wage freeze for all of us in the broader public sector, so teachers, doctors, us as MPPs. I think that was a better approach. Nonetheless, we did support the bill because at least it was a step in the right direction. But how did we get here? I mean, education spending has gone up by $8.5 billion. We have 250,000 fewer students in our schools, so more money, fewer kids, and our test results have flatlined at best. They've actually declined in mathematics. Now we have chaos in our schools, so it's not exactly been much of an accomplishment. Chaos in the schools? You know, chaos? Well, we got threats of strikes again on, on Friday. Yeah. We've got withdrawal of activities across the province. No extracurriculars, I know. But we get the highest test scores in the English-speaking world, too. Well, I, you know, actually, I, I'm very concerned that our scores internationally have plateaued, if not declined, relative to countries we're going to have to take on and compete with in the time ahead. The, the one point I want to get back to when you ask about the, um, the liberal leadership contenders, I guess the one thing I've seen in moving away from, from the McGinty agenda, it seems like if they're going in any direction, they're trying to get back um, in a close relationship with the public sector union leadership. And I, I, and I worry what that means. I worry that's a signal that the floodgates, they plan to open the floodgates of spending. And they had a mutually beneficial relationship. 
The union supported the government in elections. The government then supported the unions in contract negotiations for some time. Unfortunately, it wasn't beneficial to taxpayers. We can't afford it. I'm worried they're signaling they're going back to that method. Well, okay, you and I are looking at the same signals. And uh, For example, I went to a Kathleen Wynne speech earlier today. She's the front runner in the leadership race. Who knows if she'll win? But she was saying, in my former incarnation as education minister, I established good relationships with all of these people. I think I can get them back to the table, but they do have to understand there's no more money. Now, that's a signal. That's we, a pretty clear signal. I, you know, you and I could, could debate and interpret the tea leaves, but mm -hmm. the reason we're trying to interpret the, the tea leaves is because they've not put anything of substance on the table. But here's what's more important. I mean, let them have their debate. They'll choose their leader in a couple of weeks' time. I'm laying out a very different track. I'm laying out bold conservative ideas to fire up our economy, to get the jobs going again, to actually get our books back in balance. We had great advice across the province last year and a half. We looked at the Drummond Report. So whatever they choose, they'll do so. But you can clearly see where our party stands, and that's what I'm laying out in our When the Money Runs Out tour. Okay, let me quote from the speech here, in which you say, over the last nine years, we've lost 300,000 well-paid manufacturing jobs, but at the same time, we've added 300,000 bureaucratic jobs to our already bloated public sector payroll. Just, well, I'm trying to be helpful here, and you understand. Is this the kind of language that is going to encourage the public sector, if you win the next election, to implement your vision for this province? You know, what we've laid out in our plan, I'll, I'll focus on the New Deal for the public sector. We launched that uh, just before Christmas time. And, and that talked about a vision for our province. So uh, it basically says to our public servants, we respect your professionalism. In fact, we want to get you engaged in the process and inject what's worked in the private sector into the public. So you set very clear goals. You measure how you achieve those goals and you reward performance. Yes, we need a pay freeze for at least a couple of years, but after that I believe in rewarding performance. It also does mean though if your job is no longer needed, you're putting in half an effort, uh, your position uh, is no longer is redundant in our province, well you're not going to be on the payroll anymore. But a very clear signal that those that want to produce and deliver high quality public services are with you, want your ideas, because we got to do more with less. But I wonder whether already bloated public sector payroll demonizes public servants. I don't think so. In fact, I hear that from public... Doesn't compliment them. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I hear that from um, people in the public sector that they know payrolls have expanded significantly. They talk about how many middle managers they are. They talk about growth in the boards of education, the local health integration networks. They talk about growth in administration. They're not seeing it on the front lines. And I sense, will everybody agree with this? Probably not. But, but I sense they're, they're engaged in the theme that we actually want to do better for um, the taxpayers who are paying the bills, that we can actually achieve more for the money we have, that we need to be open to new ideas. There's this sclerosis that's impacting the public sector because we've had a government that's been paralyzed the last number of years. They basically walked off the job last October. Do I sense I'll win all the public sector votes? Well, you know, of course not, but do I sense they're engaged in the need for change? Absolutely. How much of the provincial government's budget goes towards paying salaries of public sector employees? We're, um, you know, we're roughly 50 uh, percent. 50 percent? Yeah. Is that higher or lower or about average from other provinces? I guess that's how you have to measure it. Um, I, I think the, the more pertinent measure is, you know, how do we compare to um, what we can afford and where Ontario has been. So at the same time that our, our economy basically staggered along, was anemic um, at best, we saw uh, about a 60 percent increase in government spending. A lot of that for pay and benefits and, and pension. And government payrolls are too large. We will need to reduce them. And I'll be very clear about that. The number of people on the government payroll will be reduced. We'll reward those who are doing a good job. At the same time, we have to get out of programs and services that we no longer see as priorities when we're facing a $30 billion deficit. The other point is we need to make sure the public sector pay and benefits reflect the ability of taxpayers to pay those bills. Mm -hmm. We've seen growth in those payments, pensions that simply are not a reality in the private sector, particularly those on fixed income. Uh, as you know, I've been going to a lot of your events as you're making these policy announcements, and you do run out that figure, 30, we're heading towards a $30 billion deficit. You use that line a lot. We're headed towards a $30 billion deficit, Don Drummond said, if we do nothing. Nobody's proposing that we do nothing. So is it responsible for you to keep pulling out this $30 billion number from your pocket? Well, it, it shows what's at risk if, if we don't if act. If we do and, nothing. But and, no one's saying we're doing nothing. But are we actually demonstrating change? I mean, we've been, what, about 14 months since the last election campaign. I, I see that time in 2012 um, as, as a lost year plus. I mean, it's hard to think of measures that were brought forward that actually seriously reduce the size and cost of government. 
Um, we've taken 10 months in this sort of dance with the, the teachers union because the current government was paralyzed on how to address these issues. So that means the hole is even deeper. And whenever the House comes back into session, the work's going to be that much tougher. Do I worry about that? Absolutely, I do. I think Donderman had some very good recommendations. You've seen that reflected in our papers. And we'll have more ideas in the time ahead. Let me just follow up on the teachers since you mentioned it. As you've heard on Friday, I think it's the second, uh, is it secondary school teachers or, plan or is it ETFO? I can't remember now. It's, it's ETFO. Yeah. It's elementary teachers. Okay. Are planning a one-day walkout. If you were Premier, what would you do about that? Well, we had a better approach. As I said, if I were Premier, I would have brought in the cross-board wage freeze, all-inclusive, no back doors, no exceptions. So the current government went down a certain path where they decided to do one-offs and they went after the teachers um, as a particular target uh, with Bill 115. It, it seems to me, we supported the bill, as I said, so it seems to me if you believe that you need the bill to rein in spending or to at least cap the increases and you brought in power then to levy fines if illegal strikes or lockouts occur, then you can't back away from those tools. I mean, if you draw a line in the sand as a government and then you run away from that line, I mean, how the heck are you going to get agreements with other unions if you don't actually stick to your original plan? So you would impose the fines that are called for in Bill 115? Absolutely. And we've called for that for some time. We should have done it by now. Okay. Uh, on this issue of making government presumably smaller and smarter and more efficient, leaner, etc., uh, you rolled out a bunch of announcements a few weeks back. I think on one day you were saying it's time to look at privatizing the LCBO. The next day, or no, excuse me, was the Ontario Lottery and Gaming on the first day, the LCBO the second day. And I'm just wondering what kind of feedback you, and again, not from the base and the true believers, what kind of feedback from the general public have you had to those ideas? Anytime you talk about gambling or alcohol, you get a lot of attention. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you do. Yeah. Yes. Um, it, it, it solicited a lot of debate and a lot of support, and then there will be those who, who oppose that. But it also helps to, to lock in the question that, I mean, what's this about from a big picture? If, if you're looking at a $30 billion deficit or anywhere in between, you need to start thinking about what are the priorities? What are the must-haves versus the nice-to-haves? If government needs to provide a service, is it best that government delivers that through a unionized public sector worker or could the private sector or not-for-profit or others do so? So it helped to focus people's minds on the fact that there's no low-hanging fruit. We've got a lot of tough choices to make. Secondly, there was a positive response to say somebody's laying up uh, ideas here to actually have the opportunity maybe to buy a bottle of wine or a six-pack of beer at your local Zares or Sobeys or convenience store. I can do that when I cross the border into nearby states and provinces. Why not here in Ontario? On the gambling side, I think people are sometimes surprised that the government runs it from top to bottom. Why can't we just be a strict regulator and respect it as opposed to investing taxpayer dollars in roulette wheels and slot machines and blackjack tables. So that's so the response I got. I think, um, you know, it, there's a realization that we need to make some difficult decisions, and these are areas that uh, I think that the vast majority of Ontarians say, you know what, let's look in these directions. We should let everybody know on Monday your LCBO ideas are going to be the subject of a program that we're going to be doing then. But before Monday, let me just ask you, we've been down this road before. And in fact, in 1995, when the Common Sense Revolution was brought in under Mike Harris, you were a part of that government, you looked at and rejected the idea of selling the LCBO, in part, I think, because you like the billion plus dollars that it brings into provincial coffers. So if it was looked at and disregarded then, why is it a good idea today? Yeah, I guess one of the few things that we didn't check off in the, uh, in the CSR, uh, a couple things here. I mean, I, I think that, that there were substantial changes made um, under the, uh, the Harrison PC government's uh, almost 200 agency stores across the province, basically. Uh, LCBO and beer store products available in variety stores, grocery stores, including a number uh, in my riding um, in Niagara that are very, very popular. Uh, we also ensured there were Sunday openings, we able to use credit cards, right? There was an improvement in customer service. That change is made. Um, a couple things I'm going to say. I think people have advanced a lot farther than politicians when it comes to choice. And I think very importantly, some difficult choices are upon us as a government from a public policy perspective. If we don't act, we're looking at a $30 billion deficit. Interest rates are at record lows. We know they're going to go up. A one-point increase in interest rates will cost us $500 million in payments on money we've already borrowed and spent. So that forces some important decisions. We've laid them out. Uh, there's no way to ask this question without looking self-interested, but the fact of the matter is TVO was mentioned in the Common Sense Revolution. You announced OLG on one day, LCBO the next day. I thought for sure TVO was coming the third day, and it didn't. Do you have any plans for this place? I, I'm, lo I'm loving the agenda. I mean, what? <laughs> and you were kind enough to come to a couple of our... You came to pretty well to every one of those yeah. roll-ups. Listen, there's more to say, and, and the theme we're striking is, are the services we have today essential 
um, when you're looking at a $30 billion deficit? Do you want to invest in more MRI scans? Do you want to help invest in breaking gridlock in the GTA to help people spend more time with family and create jobs? Or do you want to invest dollars in nice shells for the LCBO uh, or for games at a casino? Or well, more stations? <laughs> So we'll have more to say about this. Look forward to coming back about other areas we think the government should get out of the business. We put two big ones on the table because we need that debate and the time has come for action. Okay, so TVO is coming. More to I say on the whole issue of what should be delivered by the government and what can be delivered by the private sector. Okay, um, let's come full circle here. Um, there's going to be a new liberal leader uh, chosen by the end of the month. and. You guys must be doing, I presume, I mean, you've got good staff who are paid to do this kind of thing. You must be doing game theory on if this one wins, we've got to think this way. If this one wins, it's a different approach. What are you thinking in that regard? Probably not as much as you'd think about that. I mean, we're, we're well, all... Well, fire your staff, we're, we're, because they should be doing that. <laughs> well, I mean, do we, do we spend time wargaming, you know, which of these seven is going to mean what and that sort of thing? No. I mean, if somebody was coming up with some new ideas and that kind of stuff, then I think we'd give more notice. The Liberals will make their decision. I, I've just not been impressed that any of them seems to have come to grips with the depth of the challenges that we face. And I, I just think that that our future as a PC party, our ability to change the direction of this province is to be predicated not on who the next liberal leader is going to be, it's going to be on what we're laying out there. What are our plans? Can we get people behind those plans? Do they understand the need for these types of changes? That's where my focus is as opposed to handicapping that race. I was interested in, in the speech that you gave earlier tonight and which we, you will continue to take around the province. The words Dalton McGinty, the word liberals does not appear once in the text. How come? You asked earlier, is this, is this sort of a, a partisan uh, approach or is it actually a presentation of the facts? And um, I think it's an indication this is not uh, a screed against the, the current government. It's a sober, uh, objective statement of where we stand in the province when it comes to our debt and our economy. How we got here, I think it's very honest and it lays out where we're going to go. So do I say liberal this, liberal that, don't make any of this? No. I think people want to see more from us than that. And they want some straight talk about how we're going to get out of this mess and we deliver. You call it straight talk, but it is a, as you paint the picture of how you perceive this province today, you are painting not a very pleasant picture. Do you run the risk of being seen as too negative? There was a premier in this province a long time ago named William Davis who had a guy named Stuart Smith right. sitting across the floor from him for the Liberals, and he very skillfully portrayed Stuart Smith as Dr. No. And it, it painted him with a negative brush and he never got past it, frankly. We, you, you've read the speech, which I appreciate, mm -hmm. and, and hopefully some of your viewers could, will watch um, when the money runs out again at OntarioPC.com. There is a strong sense of optimism that I feel in my gut, that I feel in my heart that Ontario can get out of the situation we're in. The, the choices aren't easy. They're difficult choices, but if we make them, we'll be the best place again in Canada for quality health care. We'll be the first place in from coast to coast for that new pharmaceutical product to you know, help fight cancer will be available. We'll have the best education system for our kids who are excelling and those who need a little extra help. That so we can actually break gridlock. We don't have to just uh, resign ourselves to increase in commute times year after year. I think our province, I'm confident our province can rebound, but we need to make those choices today. And the central theme, what I said at the beginning and at the end of our presentation, Ontario's comeback is about to start. We are going to bounce back. Here's how we're going to do it. And in our last 20 seconds here, do you think people trust you yet? There's always a thing about politicians, but uh, you know that that you know the first thing is I'm a politician, so trust what I have to say. But here's uh, I think when people see that uh, the state we're in, and they see that we're actually offering some pretty tough choices. The basic part of our message is we can get out of where we are, but we need to take some tough medicine. If we don't take that, it's going to be worse down the road. It's a pretty sober message. Not everybody's going to react to that positively right away. But just like when people are making decisions about their own home about running their own business. When they're in debt, you've got to make some tough calls to get out of it. Uh, I think people react very strongly uh, to that because we're being honest about the situation and what it's going to take to get out of it. That's Tim Hudak, opposition leader, leader of the Ontario PCs. As always, we thank you for coming into TVO and sharing your views. My pleasure. Thanks for the time. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.